Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Appreciate your coming out tonight. If I uh, uh, have to tell you about our speaker tonight, you're not reading enough. <laughs> you're not paying close enough attention. And uh, so uh, in order to devote the, the full hour to uh, the illumination, I know he's going to bring it. Let me just say that we will welcome, uh, I think, America's, uh, certainly one of America's current preeminent historians, a son of the Midwest, Douglas Brinkley. I'd like to start by saying, I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, Jack Kerouac, Ken Kesey, Hunter Thompson, Norman Mailer, uh, Dean Acheson, Gerald Ford, Walter Cronkite. What are all these people doing in the same sentence or the same biography? Uh, no one else I can think of has uh, encountered as many, known as many, studied as many, uh, uh, and written now about as many folks as you have. So uh, it's a little hard to know, Doug, where to start. But uh, let, let's go back to the beginning, at least one of the earliest things I could find about you. At age eight, you wrote an encyclopedia, you called it, about the Americans you admired most. And I'm curious to know who was in there and then, is there, was there anybody in there that if you were writing it today, you might leave out? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to be here at Purdue. I've had a, an incredible time, and you're very lucky to have a, a president that's this intellectually engaged, and it's always a pleasure to be with you, Mitch. I grew up not that far. I don't know if anybody knows where Perrysburg, Ohio is, on the, but along the Maumee River. And a friend of mine from Perrysburg, Dave Morton's here. I see him. Um, but my mom was an English teacher, and she just died a few weeks ago. So I've been mourning her death, but she really pushed reading and writing on me. And uh, I got very enamored with American history, but my encyclopedia, I'm afraid to say, was largely uh, filled with folk figures. Mm. Um, Paul Bunyan, Davy Crockett, uh, Kit Carson, uh, but in that cut was Theodore Roosevelt, who I later wrote maturely about as an adult, John Hancock, mm -hmm. and Paul Revere, who I had uh, obsessions with. And I also got very interested in the painter Thomas Hart Benton. I have a daughter named after, named Benton Brinkley, because his murals of American life that you could see at the Truman Library in Independence, for example, just kind of fascinated me because in a Benton mural, you saw all of America happening at once. So oil drilling, the judge, mm -hmm. the dance hall. And it kind of made me realize, as the great writer Thomas Wolfe said, uh, there are you know, a billion forms of America, but we all here, everybody tonight, we're living our life on a you know, week by week basis. And we're sharing popular culture, politics, diplomacy, history. So I think I got, a very, uh, got very, I romanticized American history probably at an age, and my mom not only saved those encyclopedia inserts, but also drawings I did, uh, uh, which seemed to be predominantly about the Vietnam War, uh, because I guess we were watching it on TV. Well, I'll be looking on Amazon for the encyclopedia <laughs> tonight and uh, reselling if I find it. <clears throat> so here at Purdue, we pat ourselves on the back a lot that we are uh, uh, somewhere near the forefront of what is now called the active learning uh, movement mode. Uh, more interactive, uh, more experiential, as they say. But you were out there a long time ahead in, in what became a, uh, of us, in what became a, uh, um, a, a much discussed and I guess emulated uh, practice. And you, it was the Magic Bus Tours, which uh, you ran out of Hofstra University, but I think you told me earlier today, before it was over, you had people signing up from Yale and other places. Can you talk about the Magic Bus the Tours? The Magic Bus began in 1992. Uh, after I got my doctorate from Georgetown, I had written a very, uh, actually two serious books, one on Dean Acheson, uh, Secretary of State for Truman, and then James Forstall, first Secretary of the Navy. They both got well-reviewed in the New York Times. So I had, as you have faculty here, I had a kind of credential at Hofstra, and I went to the president and said, look, I, I, these students have never been to Gettysburg. They've never been to, you know, the, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. They've never seen the Grand Canyon. And uh, why can I create an all-purpose, on-the-road uh, bus trip where students register on a bus for a semester but get credit from the university? Well, lo and behold, he greenlit it, and I had all the students read about 35 books 
of the best literature, almost great books, but a lot of contemporary literature. And uh, we would visit authors, and I was connected with Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Doris Kearns Goodwin, who both would frequent my bus as guest lecturers. <laughs> but not only that, they all would connect me with people. So I would have students, we would go to Arthur Miller's house, and the students would read Death of the Salesman, and then they would have a Q&A with Arthur Miller. Then I'd take them to Toni Morrison's house. And um, we had on the bus Bo Diddley, um, we, we, uh, Waylon Jennings, Kinky Friedman, you know, they're so, um, Towns Van Zant, great folk singer, uh, Richie Havens. Uh, so on and on it went, and it, it went, and the New York Times did a story about it, and then a woman named Elizabeth Gilbert of, wrote a profile of me on Spin Magazine. She went on to write Eat, uh, Pray, Love, and, and Gilbert lived on the Magic Bus one of my years with me. So it became a storied class, and students from all over the country are like, I want to ride on the magic bus. So I then was able to extend it so students from Yale, University of Virginia, um, uh, Tulane University, um, uh, Haskell Indian College, I wanted a community college involved with this too, mixing community college with Yale. And uh, I kept doing it, and eventually the two magic buses ran on natural gas under the slogan, clean across America. <laughs> and uh, we got all the way up to Alaska where we read Jack London and John McPhee and Robert Service and other writers. 35 books uh, for a semester. That's, that, that, maybe that should be a new standard for Purdue. <laughs> I, uh... Well, they have read them because we would do classroom discussions on the road. And you know, corporate America, we, once they saw the New York Times wrote about it, if I sent them that clipping, Marriott chain, for example, gave us free rooms a lot of places, and restaurants would say, oh, like we, I would get a hold of, uh, uh, to very quick, because I know we want to get other things. So I wrote a little piece about Chuck Berry, the rock and roll guy in the Wall Street Journal once, and I said Chuck Berry was a poet. And I wrote a little bit about his lyrics or poetry, and suddenly I got a call from a guy named Joe Edwards, who runs Blueberry Hill in St. Louis, and Joe said, Chuck read what you wrote, and when your magic bus comes to St. Louis, yeah. you're the guest of Chuck Berry. So we would go up and meet Chuck and his wife, and he would let my students play drums, and Whoa. he would play guitars with them. La cut to two months ago, I got a call. Chuck Berry is 90 years old no. and has just written a whole bunch of new songs and asked me to write the liner notes for them. So I thought, wow, 91, it's, it, when it, it, he is now, I thought, you know, this is going to be like his goodbye. It is it's amazing music at, for somebody 91. Um, and so I've formed friendships with people like that from all, doing this kind of uh, thing. Look for it this June, the Ch new Chuck Berry CD. It's wild. <laughs> well, some people here won't know that you just got a Grammy. I think it was for liner notes. And so maybe there's another Grammy well, in your future. I, get a, I got a Grammy this year for a project called Presidential Suites. And what I did is with Wynton Marsalis and Ted Nash and Jazz at Lincoln Center, we took oratory of the greats. Churchill and Reagan were included, but John F. Kennedy and Nehru. And we took this, mu and then we put jazz compositions around the words. And it, it was called Presidential Suite. And well, the, the band at Lincoln Center, Jazz at Lincoln Center, they're, they're mm -hmm. unbelievable players. And so we did this CD, and lo and behold, it got nominated for a Grammy. And so I brought my little daughter, Cassidy, who's 10, who wanted her to wear her 10-year-old Grammy dress. And I brought my, and my wife came, and we didn't figure we'd win, but we won. Uh, and so it was a, a big honor and great fun for us all. I don't think anyone among us uh, in America today can be said to know more and have thought more deeply and studied more closely the presidents, particularly of the last century, but all of them. So uh, what I'm curious to know is, if we were starting Mount Rushmore today, you were the designer, who'd be on it? Uh, interesting question. I, I, the two figures that are dominant or that aren't on it are, are in my mind are Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. Um, now, we had just done, worked on a C-SPAN poll, and I know you have the Brian Lamb School and all that here, and every time these polls come out every four years, we, this year we had a pooling of 91 scholars. Number one is always Lincoln, num and number two is always Washington, um, and number three is always FDR. FDR is so giant, not just because he won in 32 and 36 and 40 and 44, which is big enough, 
Not only did he guide us through the Great Depression with the New Deal programs, but he won World War II, and he put all the right people in place, and, and we have Social Security and the rest. But we lived in the age of FDR from 1932 all the way to 1980 with Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, beca because up until that 80, people believe the federal government is your friend. That's the shadow of FDR, so Truman will do create the CIA, Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, you know, um, Air Force, on and on government. Um, I, um, Eisenhower does the interstate highway system and the St. Lawrence Seaway and Kennedy, we're gonna put a man to the moon, it's the government. Um, Lyndon Johnson's whole great society is like the New Deal, Medicaid, Medicare, on and on. Nixon creates the EPA, Endangered Species Act. Jimmy Carter creates FEMA and Department of Energy and Education. And then Reagan. And Reagan was the rollback of saying that was way too much federal. The federal government's not there to save you where you're being overtaxed. You need to be, stop wasting taxpayers' money. Suspicion of the federal government. And so even in this, the two real, poli if you want to say political history, the giants are FDR and Reagan. In many ways, we're living in the age of Reagan right now where we're kind of a center, center-right country. And if you want to operate in a center left, you've got to triangulate like Bill Clinton did or be so unbelievably charismatic like Barack Obama was. Mm. How important is character or virtue in a president? Can you be a great president uh, uh, without them or with, with bad character? Um, you know, I think about that question a lot and I used to always, mainly because I'm a teacher at heart, I'm a professor at, Rice University, and I always tell students, you know, the best presidents are ones who don't lie. They tell the American people the truth because we're a tough lot and we can handle it. And character matters the most in presidents. But then I studied FDR, and he used to make things up all the time. Uh, you know, he, he was a masterful, deceitful liar. Um, and, and yet I rank him as one of the great presidents. So in, in, he had a, a great character, but he could be very, very deceptive. So I think by and large, character matters tremendously. I would put it still first with the caveat that if you're a really great Machiavellian politician, sometimes you'll do things for the larger public interest that might be deceptive, but in the long run was, was what the country needed to be done at that time. Um, switching only slightly, is Johnny Depp really a good writer, or did did, did you carry him? You had two <laughs> collaborations with him, and um, I just want to know who really did the work. <laughs> well, um, the I got to know the actor Johnny Depp, and where he's a good friend of mine. He's over in Europe doing a movie now. We just became friends, but. Uh, I've gotten a chance to, we did a, a documentary together called Gonzo, which got nominated for a, a Grammy, uh, where we both collaborated in our own different ways. Um, but usually our interest is mainly about music, rock and roll, um, which I have an interest in. I, you know, it's just, a, he's that way. But we're just friends. And it got kind of famous because I wrote a Vanity Fair cover story about Depp and I traveling by boat from the Bahamas to uh, Puerto Rico. And it was a wild time at the, in the ocean. And then we, he bought an island. So we went and stayed on his like miss, a little island. And so the piece became- He didn't dress up like a pirate. Ah, really. No, but, but he, it was on his pirate money. Oh, yeah. He had a private, <laughs> he had a private plane, Captain Jack Airlines, you know, <laughs> honestly. Because he bought a private plane and all the <laughs> money he made out of that, that uh, Disney series. In fact, there's a, he has another Pirates coming out this, uh, this summer, but I've gotten to know a number of different actors, but they're usually in my generation that I've be, become friends with. But um, Depp and I happened to collaborate on a few things that worked. Um, you said the pro first project was Gonzo. I assume it was referring to Hunter Thompson, one of the more uh, unusual characters. Again, not too many people who spent a lot of time studying American presidents hung out with Hunter Thompson. <laughs> so you're going to have to tell us a little bit. About how did you come well, to I know, know him and what was know, he like? I know the writer, Hunter Thompson. When I grew up, I went to the Ohio State University, so I'm a Big Ten guy. But uh, we, uh, I, it, when I went there, I was the class of 78. And that's right when Hunter Thompson was at his kind of um, high water mark. He had written a book called Hell's Angels, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72. 
That campaign trail book redefined political coverage because Hunter made the media people part of his story, and it's, a, it's truly a political classic, he wrote. Uh, but I was susceptible to his writing away. A previous generation would have been to Hemingway's lore or whatever, you know. Um, and, um, and so I, I was a, a fan. But when I did that Magic Bus tour, he lived in Colorado, and I had my students read Fear and Loathing in Vegas, which probably is the best book on the 60s as a novel, new journalism. I mean, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff's mm -hmm. tremendous on space, and Wolfe did one called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Uh, but those guys were new journalists, you know, where they would put themselves in their narrative, and it's exciting creative writing. But what I had uh, in common with Hunter was mainly I watched him as a craftsman. I mean, in the end, Mitch, what connects all this is I've always tried to learn how to write mm -hmm. and put words together. And in order to do your trade, be like if some of you are a carpenter here, you're watching how other people do carpentry work, getting to get to see how Hunter did stuff. He used to always tell me, every line matters, don't you understand? <laughs> That's a heavy, I would never give that to any student here. That's a heavy trip. Just get your paper in. But what he, <laughs> on time, but what he meant is every line has to really be gem-like. And Conrad, Joseph Conrad used to say that. And it's, 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 it, it was good for me to see how somebody, and the other thing was always have a lead, the good lead paragraph. Don't get in boring. Start it off with the bang. Get your best material and put it in to draw the reader. And so I actually benefited from him uh, somewhat. He also was one of the best friends of Jim Irsay of the Colts. And Col he used to send Hunter bags of Colts gears and get Hunter all going to watch Indianapolis Colts out in, in uh, Aspen. Connor would put on his Colts hat and all because he, Ursay would just give him boxes of stuff. Why? Because Ursay loved his books and was just trying to be nice to Hunter. Hunter died in, uh, some years ago and uh, uh, had, had a real problem with alcohol, so he, it was his alcoholism caught up with him in the end. So you, you learned from his literary skills but not his lifestyle. <laughs> well, the one thing I miss about Hunter Thompson is that I like I didn't even I was so busy here. We went I went to the basketball game for the big Purdue win and and, and congratulations guys. That was an amazing game. Yeah. And, uh, but in the old days when Hunter was alive, if you missed something like um, Donald Trump's State of the Union address, You'd be listening to the CNN commentary where I work. So you, let's say you turn on your TV, and then if you got a call from Hunter and he stayed up late, his take on what he just saw <laughs> would be so hilarious <laughs> that you know he, he was in the end a, a great satirist and um, and you know in, in a very funny uh, a lampooning of American culture and uh, and so he's just a writer that I, I admired. I hold on to my boyhood heroes a little stronger that maybe he's healthy, including Neil Armstrong of Purdue and, uh, and um, Kurt Vonnegut, who was of Indiana. And I once got to profile for Rolling Stone Vonnegut mm -hmm. for a long time. And you know, I got to know these people a little bit. And uh, I love their books, love Vonnegut's novels. I want to ask you something about your craft, because you've done some projects, two big ones that I'm aware of, and there may have been others. The Reagan Diaries and the Nixon Tapes, in which instead of uh, doing all the, the writing originally yourself, you're editing and so pouring through mountainous pre-existing material, trying to decide what to keep, maybe what to say about it. Is, is that harder or easier than than well, sitting down really to write a, work on a book? It's a lot more work, but the Reagan Diaries, um, Ronald Reagan kept a regular diary in the White House. And I knew he kept a sporadic one. I didn't realize he did every single day except when he was shot for a few days, the attempted assassination, for eight years all the time. And uh, I got a random phone call from uh, Governor Pete Wilson of California, who I knew little, and he said, Doug, your name's come up. You might be good to be the one who edits Reagan's diaries. I said, he said, I said, I said, count me in. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. how you were you kidding me. He said, well, you have to meet Mrs. Reagan and she has to agree that you're the person, but I think you're the one. And we have a bunch of people I've consulted. And I said, well, what do I have to do? And he said, you've got to go to the Beverly Hills Hotel and meet her. And their advice they gave me, Mitch, was um, if you're in a lull, talk about Hollywood movies. She loved to talk about movies. 
current movies, um, not just when she was in film, but what's going on now. And if she mentions the historian Edwin, um, uh, if, uh, Morris. Edwin, Morris, Edwin Morris, if she says his name, pivot, and don't even talk about it. Well, Edmund Morris had written a biography called Dutch of Ronald Reagan, where he fictionalized her husband. Mm -hmm. And she had chosen him to be biographer. And she felt deeply burned. Mm -hmm. And the problem they were having, the Reagan people letting loose of Reagan's diaries, was Mrs. Reagan wasn't trustful. Mm -hmm. So the thought was, uh, maybe I could get a relationship with her. So I sat in the Nancy Reagan booth, it was called, at the, uh, and ordered the Nancy Reagan Cobb salad. <laughs> and we were getting along splendidly until at one point I said, um, I said, well, Mrs. Reagan, you know, if you give me these, I'm not, you're going to have some real heart rock rib conservatives angry that you're giving it to me because I'm, I'm seeing more as a centrist uh, person and you're going to be, a, you're going to have, um, you might get some squawk. She just glared at me mm -hmm. and said, what's your point? My son is more liberal than you'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, good point, all right. <laughs> and she then was great, and I moved out to Simi Valley and um, had a child born out there by the Reagan Library and then did this project, The Reagan Diaries. It was a lot of work, uh, a different kind of work, but I would put like header notes on all of them and then having to cut it down and boil it into a volume, it became a popular book. Um, the Nixon tapes, I don't know if you all realize, Richard Nixon, people talk about taping. Yes, presidents tape their phone calls, but Nixon voice activated the whole place. So there are tapes with plates clinking and glasses tinkling and people, and it's unedited all the time. So we're, we have like 3,800 hours of tapes. Um, the reason we were able to go to it is there's new audio experts that have been able to work mm -hmm. through that sound-wise. And secondly, the guy that I worked with, Luke Nichter, was a genius um, transcriber with the t -t -t -t. Mm. So what I did is a pile of this stuff <laughs> to edit through and make sense out of and then try to set it up. And both of those projects were much more time consuming than I had originally anticipated. I imagine. I'll, I can tell you more later, but Edmund Morris, uh, one, one day I went to the, the every morning eight o'clock meeting in the Roosevelt Room, and there's this guy sitting on the couch by, right behind me, and he was there for the next year and a half. He had unparalleled access. Yes. I think that I, I didn't know that it's not a surprise that she thought poorly of him later, but they had... Oh, she green-lit him. Yeah. And, you know, she, Mrs. Reagan was the protector of Ronald Reagan, so... Um, she didn't make many mistakes. She was right. a keen judge of character and who was the right person, but she felt she may have botched this. He's actually an amazing historian, wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book on TR that had lured her in and is uh, now writing a, what it will probably be close to definitive biography of Thomas Edison, uh -huh. which is sorely needed. So I don't mean to talk negatively of him. I'm a big fan of him, but he did kind of get squirrely with that Dutch. He's a remarkable talent. I got yeah. to know him some, and, he, uh, and his TR book was spectacular. Spe one of my, some of my favorite yeah. books is his trilogy right. on Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I want to, one more question about the diaries. The inside, inside the cover, front and back, there's, in, in his handwriting, there's a replication of just one entry out of all those thousands of pages you were talking about. And I was just struck by it. I was curious if you chose that particular one, and if so, why? And the, the entry is, is the president writing, it's, it might have been the first, one of the first entries after he's out of the hospital. And he says that, uh, after being shot, and he says that, he had sought God's help uh, there in the room where he's coughing up blood and so forth. But he uh, said he realized he couldn't do that uh, while hating the, he said, mixed up young man who just shot me. That's sort of a um, moving thing to read. I was just curious we why did, We picked that it because it was so moving. And I think it, you know, we, remember, we forget when Ronald Reagan got inaugurated, he was inaugurated, you know, you get inaugurated late January, and he was shot in, in March. So he wasn't president very long, and he really almost died. But right when he, before where they're going, that he had consciousness, he we remember looking at the ceiling, and then they, he went under and they operated, and when he woke up, uh, he really had almost a religious epiphany, you know, almost losing your life. And 
I think it made him, he was never a man of malice. Talk about Lincoln's famous with malice towards none. That is Ronald Reagan. He never had malice towards people. Uh, he didn't like enemies. He tried to befriend everybody. But I do believe after that near-death experience, he became more determined to rid the world of nuclear weapons. And it, 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 I don't want to say it softened him. It actually strengthened him. It made him realize life is short, my time is short, and I really want to do something positive for humanity. And, um, and so one of the reasons Reagan gets ranked quite high now is because of that diplomacy with Mikhail Gorbachev that he did and, and eventually um, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Claire Booth Luce uh, once uh, told him, as was widely reported, she said, Mr. President, every president gets one sentence in history and yours will be he won the Cold War without firing a shot. Those of us who were enthusiasts, used, I always say, no, he was a two sentence president because it could also be said that he restored the American economy and spirit, which was a different do you, do you think every president uh, finally gets reduced in history to a sentence? Well, you know, you do. Like if I ask you about, well, first of all, some get forgotten. Like if I honestly ask people, tell me what you remember of Rutherford B. Hayes, who was, <laughs> I grew up right near us in Perrysburg, Fremont, most people don't know, but we remember the big things that people um, do. I'm afraid now we live in a soundbite culture since the advent of television. So, um, you know, John F. Kennedy forever is ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I, I, everybody here knows that line. Uh, and you think of that as Kennedy. And Ronald Reagan got Mr. Gorbachev tear down the wall. And it kind of lives on. Bill Clinton had the, I did not have. <laughs> <laughs> And he was really a very good two-term president, balanced the budget. You know, you can really argue the case of Bill Clinton's presidency, but in the public imagination, it becomes that Lewinsky scandal gets very, you know, or, 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 or the Clinton prop scandal, I guess, whatever. And, um, and so it's the, you get the, sometimes now it's not just the line, but it's that image, the soundbite you're remembered for. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things in those diaries. I, I, I love, though, the, maybe more than any, the, no, the uh, notation he put in when he, uh, was, wa he was watching the Jerry Lewis telethon for, uh, what is it, muscular dystrophy? And he called in and he tried to make a pledge and the operators didn't believe it was him. Oh, yeah. He was very, <laughs> it's, and, and the other thing about Reagan that I thought's very shrewd and I think all, and FDR did this, something they both, they would tell people, I want to see letters from everyday people and they would get the, you know, you wrote the president, both FDR and Reagan would grab the mail and they would get letters from any of you who wrote it and they would personally respond to them, not just a form letter, you know, they took the interest to kind of stay in tune with the American people in, in, uh, in that way. There's a lot of similarities between Reagan and FDR that are, uh, they both were very sunny optimists. Mitch, I tried to find times when FDR in polio, unable mm. to walk, is, was really bitter and angry and negative. Mm. It's tough. I mean, he was always making everybody else feel good around him, and uh, Reagan was that way, and that's a reason why they both are, are so successful, I think. Mm. Optimism is an oxygen in this country. People want to feel good. I'm going to come back to that on the final question, but we're going to have, we're going to hear from uh, some questions from some of our students uh, in between. But um, uh, just, just before going there, uh, I've, got to, I've got to ask this. It's really, really hard to find anything uh, remotely negative about Douglas Brinkley. However, I do have to ask, <laughs> what did you do to tick off this guy, Bill Bryson, <laughs> who wrote, I had to, I want to give this to you exactly. He wrote, a minor, ac of him, a minor academic whose powers of observation and generosity of spirit would fit comfortably into a proton <laughs> and still leave room for an echo. Now, if, <laughs> now if Bryson had gone to Purdue University, he probably would have said neutrino or, he had, or something a lot more... Uh, in well, but, that, but you know, I, uh, what Bill, in the world? Well, Bill Bryson wrote a book of history that I reviewed for the Washington Post, and he got a very bad review from me, to put it mildly, um, because it had um, so many errors in it, and I called him out on all of it. So I think he uh, he he popped off online 
about the review. I liked his other books. He write, he's a travel writer and a very distinguished one, actually. Um, but in this book, you try to write about 1927. And when you're a historian and you're trying to write pop, you notice things that are wrong, uh, you know? And so they, you call somebody out for their errors. They're never very happy. But I've called other people out for their, their errors, and they haven't had a spasm like that. They, they, they <laughs> but he did. Fit you into a proton. <laughs> OK. Well, we, uh, we invited the uh, what we call PIC, the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication, as well as our Honors College and our ambassadors, those walking backwards uh, heroes of mine who, who uh, welcome people to campus and uh, very frequently uh, interest them in coming to Purdue uh, uh, to, to uh, nominate some of their members to ask some questions tonight. And so let's uh, work our way uh, as far as we can down the list. Marley Beck. Marley Beck, welcome, Marley. Hello again, and Thank you. ask away. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Marley. I'm a freshman here at Purdue, and I have a question. Um, so I know you have extensive experience looking at bias and trying to distinguish fact from personal opinion, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts or just in general, like, what you think about the idea that perhaps um, in schools, in high schools, and in colleges, we students receive almost a Western biased um, perspective of history. And is that relevant? Is that something that occurs? And is that dangerous? That's a great question. Very, um, very smart question. Yeah, I think there. I don't know how dangerous, but it's not right. I mean, we're we're we're. In other words, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, I'm very American centric. Um, mainly because I couldn't really, get, I had to, for my doctorate, learn two languages. So I learned Spanish and, and French, but barely got through them. So I'm not very good at, at it. And, it's, and when you can't read other people's archival material, I'm always giving the American perspective. Meaning if I'm writing on the Cold War with uh, Adenauer and Eisenhower, I can't really go do German archives because I don't speak German. So there becomes a bit of a provincialism in some of, some of um, the book, um, what I do. And unfortunately, I get a lot more glory because I'm an Americanist and people here will buy a book about America where the world, unfortunately, is so complicated and multicultural and we're, there, we, don't, we don't stress it enough. I mean, try selling a book if you're writing on you know, China in the 13th century. But do you know how much work that is to do those kinds of books? A scholar has to go to China, learn the language. And so I always honor history faculties, and you guys have a great one here, people that can do that kind of uh, work. But I suppose every culture, every country in the world's probably starting to look at things from their perspective. But hopefully we open our minds and try to understand. Uh, we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble if we understood what was going on in Vietnam War than just the American you know, involvement, or if we understood the Middle East, understood the um, Islamic world better than we do. I'm not saying people don't know, but the popular culture often doesn't. So uh, it's important to go to university and take classes that try to open your mind. And, and the great Duke Ellington used to say, no boxes. You know, don't be put in a box like I'm just this. Try to open your mind up. I've been able to open myself up to a lot of currents in US history but I would flunk out if I had to do the history of Brazil or China, because my, my knowledge base would be coming from an American perspective. Megan Finucane, I hope I've said that close to right, but Megan, I, got no, I know I got the Megan right. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, first of all. Um, you know, and I'm in PR and marketing, so kind of taking more of a perspective looking at media, how have you used that starting from <coughs> all the different forms that you use when you're discovering different biographies and history to present day. And has that helped you? And what's kind of your view looking more in the future with the use of media? Great question, too. Um, you know, they used to, journalism is the first draft of history. It's a cliche. But if I'm going to go write about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm going to go look at how all the newspapers covered it. Then, because it's TV, I want to see the televised clips the best I can. And that's all part of it. I mean, you here at Purdue with the C-SPAN archive are sitting on a, a treasure trove. Uh, because C-SPAN has been documenting American politics and 
culture, political life in a way like nobody else has. And it's just invaluable for scholars wanting to write a book. If I were going to write a book on Gloria Steinem and the women's movement, she's been on C-SPAN, um, you know, probably uh, you'll find her on there a hundred times or more, and you'll be able to get transcripts of everything she said and footnoted and use them as source work. Um, but a broader question on media culture now, things are really, it's out of control um, with the, um, the social media world. And I don't really know quite how to navigate it. I was pretty strong through the age of Cronkite <laughs> and even cable TV, but now with you know all of these different media forms, I will just tell you that Cronkite told me before he passed that uh, he was very concerned about the misuse of the internet in journalism and fake news and how news and entertainment were being blurred and that he thought it was going to be one of the giant problems in the American culture was, was fake news, alternative facts, when you don't have a, somebody streamlining it, it just, you know, pick your own short group of facts that serve your own particular interests. So you know, we're in a kind of media crisis in America right now, but I think it's because of the technology came on so quickly and people are trying to make sense of it and, and eventually there'll be ways to make adjustments. But when things happen fast, it some, some, sometimes takes a while to adjust. Really, Donald Trump shocked everybody with his use of Twitter. Um, but in the next four years, somebody else will have a new tool, and then there'll be a new tool. And it's largely positive, but there are downsides to, uh, to it. I, I do think there's a movement to kind of shut, shut out the noise sometimes. Uh, I believe that we need solitude at times and, uh, and don't um, constantly be plugged in. And I, my kids drive me crazy. I make them go hiking and things just so they're not doing their electronics, you know, um, every minute. Well, Megan, thank you for being the great tour guide you are. I know you're one of those, one of those people that, uh, that I was talking about. And you have a, your 150 years of Purdue coming up. Uh, well, but we won't, will you be, oh, you'll be here, 2009. That's going to be exciting, uh, uh, 150 years. And then you also have... The, which I'm interested in, 50 years of going to the moon, Neil Armstrong in 2019, and all that means for the national spotlight on Purdue for producing so many extraordinary astronauts of the Cold War generation and beyond. We'll have two more up there very soon, yep. for a while at the, at the same time, next spring. So. Oh, really? Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, That's for a little great. while at the station. Trevor, where's Tre there's Trevor, Trevor Peters. <clears throat> Yes, well, first off, thank you so much for, uh, it's great to have awesome historians coming, like you come and visit us here in West Lafayette. And so on behalf of all the students, we really appreciate uh, you. you being here with us uh, this evening. So um, you do a lot of television and newspaper interviews, especially with CNN and with uh, the New York Times. Um, and you're asked to comment on the U.S. presidency and the current U.S. president. So um, we've heard a lot recently about media bias. Do you believe there's truth to these thoughts? And if so, do you think it's gotten worse over the past decade? It's really, that word bias, and I know it's come up before, it's so hard because we all, every one of you here are carrying some kind of bias because you're coming at life from a perspective. Uh, but I still think that we can have a fact-based culture and we can find out if a New York story is factually correct or not. If a Washington Post story is factually correct, what, um, a Wall Street Journal factually correct. And I think we're beating up on our press too much. There are a lot of great journalists out there that put their lives on the line in, in far-flung places to try to bring us information and all. But they're becoming the whipping child of the moment uh, because Nixon at one point wanted to go after the press too with Spiro Agnew. No presidents like the press. They just don't. I mean, they fake it. They be, but you know, who if you're getting drilled every day, and you know, who are these people to ask me and all? But uh, I thought it was unfortunate when Donald Trump you said that the press is the enemy. I think they, he it was the wrong word uh, to express whatever frustration he was feeling. Um, but um, that's you know, there are other people that thank thank goodness because they really feel that the liberals have been running. CBS, ABC, NBC, The Times, and the rest, and that now there's the, the uh, an alternative views. But it's really partisan politics playing out now between each side's sense of facts and the media culture. It's a nightmare out there. I mean, it's not fun to be on CNN like it used to be. I'm the historian there, and I actually have been prided myself of being able to be, I always thought a historian was to be judicial, 
to be a, ju a justice almost on fact. And here it is, but you get out there now, it's a killing field. <laughs> you can't say anything. Like if you said, well, Donald Trump's um, uh, speech last evening was his best speech yet. The, the left will go, whoa, 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 you know, and then if you say, you know, the, um, you know, but Mitch McConnell's uh, comment was awful. I mean, they, they just, you can't be judicial because you're, if people are asking, which side are you on? They, like the only thing in Texas, they say the only thing in the middle is yellow lines and dead armadillos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I've spent my whole life kind of being in the center, and I don't want to be the dead armadillo, you know? So I'm like, guys, you know, but it, it might calm down a little bit in another year or so, but that 2016 election would just uh, knock the stuffings out of everybody. Daniel Romery. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, so you were talking about how this, the country seems to be very polarized today. And I suspect that in history, uh, this isn't the only time that it's been polarized. So how do we um, learn from history and, and overcome these challenges with polarization? I have a saying that I've kind of adopted that uh, the point of history is to remind us that our own times aren't uniquely oppressive and we're constantly feeling how bad things are right now. I don't know, I mean, the stock market's at an all-time high, you know, there's air conditioning, medical miracles, education, you know, it's not that bad of time, guys, to be alive, <laughs> truly, when you go back and study the Civil War or, or other, um, you know, eras in American history. So I think we have to be careful that we're not constantly uh, um, doing this sort of how awful everything is right now and how unprecedented everything is. Uh, with that said, as a big caveat, uh, it is pretty polarized out there. I mean, I haven't seen it this bad in my lifetime. Maybe the Vietnam War when I was a child, you're either a hawk or a dove, uh, started defining a generation. Uh, but there was still a kind of bipartisanship in Congress during that era to get other stuff done. Right now, it's, uh, you know, I promise you, there are a lot of Republican people in the Congress that didn't want to be in a photo op with President Obama because it would hurt him. Just a photo op with the, the sitting president. They don't want to be in a photo op with them. And there are a lot of Democrats that don't want to be in a photo op with Donald Trump right now. It never used to be that bad. It used to always be an honor to go meet a president. Yes, during the Civil War, it was that bad. You know, when, when Abraham Lincoln, you know, seven southern states didn't even have Lincoln on the ballot, you know, and uh, he had to get snuck into D.C. practically with a double and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, so it was much worse back then, but this is one of the most tense, par uh, you know, moments. But and then you go back to the 1800 election, Adams and Jefferson, and you read the press, they were just trashing each other, you know, so it goes through, I think, cycles, but we're definitely in a bit of a vicious cycle right now. Noah Smith. Hello. So it sounds like you've talked to and gotten to know pretty well some of the most distinguished and accomplished people that have lived in the last century. What do you think it is that separates those people that are successful in the public sphere and their private lives from those who are not? Boy, interesting questions. Um, it's about will and drive and persistence and never quitting. Um, there's a a writer named Peter Matheson who wrote a book called Snow Leopards. And he wrote about the rare cat, the snow leopards in the Himalaya mountains, the very top of the mountain. And he said, at some point in American life, it's all the snow leopards and everybody else. And the snow leopards are people that are the best, uh, the best MD Anderson liver um, cancer doctor, the best, um, you know, real estate broker of New York, the best NBA basketball owner, the best, you know, and they all share this just determination to, um, to make something of themselves in an incredible passion in hard work, unless you're born a genius. And sometimes there are there. I, in the jazz world, there's a guy now, Joey Alexander, I think he's 13 now, and he's like a, a prodigy. But those are very rare. Most of it's just never, never quitting, never giving up. Just keep going and going and going. Don't let anything stop you. If you have a dream, go for it. I know it sounds old fashioned, but it really is. Just go for it and don't stop. And everybody will try to knock you over and you never let anybody knock you, knock you down and, and um, good things happen. Michaela Weiland. 
Oh, Hi. sorry, we're <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, you said earlier that we're in this Reagan era where, and he said that the federal government is not there to save you. What do you think that Ronald Reagan would think of the state of our country today? He would not like the tone uh, of, con um, the one thing Reagan wanted to do was be a uniter of the American people. He wouldn't like all of this, that kind of uh, finger pointing and hatred, but he was disliked in 81 when he came in by, you know, a lot of um, Democrats didn't take him seriously. I think when he was shot, um, in fact, President Obama asked me, I, we have these White House meetings with President Obama, at one point he said, how did Reagan become so, everybody thinks he's okay now, when I remember, when he was so polarizing in 81, <laughs> and I said, well, he was shot, and the country mm -hmm. pulled from me, and he goes, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he he got to be another way. He said, that's not, not an option. And, uh, and, and, uh, but, you know, the, um, he, the, he's, he, so people like, the, no, but nobody's enjoying what's going on right now when fellow Americans are attacking other Americans. And I don't think it's us. I think it's a lot to do with media culture that's doing it, because I live in Austin, Texas, and all my fr I don't know which ones of my, or I have three kids, parents are Republican, Democrat, you know, who cares what student here is Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter, we're just Americans pulling together, so the really great presidents have that, that w wanting to unite us, um, and let's hope that uh, President Trump um, is able to try to do that in the coming years. Maddie. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, um, as far as presidents since JFK, how would you rank them, especially um, among areas of advancing prosperity in the United States? Okay. So you're asking, if you didn't hear the way back of since John F. Kennedy, uh, which ones do, we, or do I think, uh, have, you know, really help push for prosperity in the United States. I'm of an odd school. I think we've been pretty lucky and had very good presidents. I think Kennedy was very good on the sense of American identity and, and you know, just like we're talking about the moonshot and pulling people together. Johnson is deeply flawed. Some of his stuff is incredible, but the Vietnam War, um, you know, caused us a lot of anguish. And he's ranked quite high because of his legislative accomplishments, but... Uh, um, it, um, Nixon had the fatal Achilles heel of enemies list and the like, but was able to do the breakthrough with China, which was big. I think Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter are, are, are great human beings, both of them. Um, really, we, you know, it's interesting, after Watergate, those, those, they ha occupied the White House for six years, and Ford's memoir is called A Time to Heal, and Jimmy Carter's Keeping Faith. It was six years we needed to be believe in our institutions, and they kind of were able to do that, uh, although you know, they're not ranked high as presidents. And then Reagan has become one of the uh, giant uh, presidents. Um, Bill Clinton was on the way to being a dynasty in many ways, and if Hillary Clinton would have won, the power of Clinton in American history and politics would have been much different. Now I don't know. Uh, what the Clinton legacy is um, going to be. And I think Barack Obama left office with a 60% approval rating. He's going to be, he's ranked number 12 now. He may get up to 10 and, or more. And, uh, you know, I think he, um, he, did a, he did a great job of inheriting the Great Recession and getting us out of it. Um, and it almost ran a scandal-free eight years. Uh, and then George Herbert Walker Bush when he passes, people are going to really <clears> say what a great foreign policy president he was because he w went into the, uh, the liberation of Kuwait in one, dealt with German reunification, breakup of the Soviet Union, loose nukes, on and on, and really ran a quite a remarkable uh, presidency. So America is still the preeminent power in the world, um, and so none of these presidents have blown it. Um, although it's been trying times, like Watergate and Vietnam in particular. You skipped one, did you mean to? Who did I skip? <laughs> 43. I did skip 43, I didn't mean to. Um, 40, for, you know, 43 just went up in the polls somewhat. Um, and, you know, for people, and we're trying to figure out why, um, but part of it, it might be in contrast to Donald Trump, certain people are thinking, we're miss, missing him. Um, <laughs> It, it, it might also be, I mean, he's handled his ex-presidency now so, so well. 
Um, and he's in, in uh, you know, in, 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 there does guys tend to be an upward revision of presidents. We hammer on them when they're in office, and then when they're gone, we, we you know, kind of miss them. It's, I mean, in, in so, but most of these presidents fare better. Even Nixon was able to get a bounce as a statesman after Watergate by working and staying in tune. When Jimmy Carter, we consider a mediocre president, when he passes, people are gonna say, oh my God, what a great human rights leader. And you get saturation media when a president dies. All of these people, when they pass, they'll be weak of just nonstop and people will start remembering the good. If I were going to write on 43, I would focus on 9-11, not get into the Iraq war, but just the leadership right at 9-11 uh, in, in the, you know, the weeks after it, which is a, a large moment in our lives, 9-11. We may still be living in the post 9-11 mm -hmm. world right now. It really is a major event in world history when those, that attack occurred. Yeah. Julie. Hi, Mr. Brinkley. Welcome to Purdue. Thank you for being here. My name is Julie. I'm from the PICC. So you wrote a lot of book, and if one day you have the chance to write your autobiography, or someone else wants to write like a biography about you, what do you think will be on the first chapter? Hmm. Why, and what do you think would the first sentence be? <laughs> I'm afraid I may be cursed with the word prolific. And I always cringe, but I, I'm now having to realize, because I do write an awful lot, so people will say, he's the most prolific, uh, which is kind of a compliment, but it's, it's um, but I think um, I would recommend people do their, I, I always believe in biography or autobiography that you live your life chronologically, and that, um, that I tell people when they do papers or bio profiles, abandon chronology at your own peril. I mean, I've had to live my life week by week, week, month by month, year by year, and I think your autobiography of all of our, our really our book, our stories are really a chronological story. But I suppose my high water mark would have been uh, making the decision not to be a lawyer. <laughs> you know, when you're a humanities person and I was a history major at Ohio State and people are saying, what are you gonna do with being a history major? And I just loved it, and I made the decision I'm going to go to graduate school in history, and that was really great for me, because uh, I was about to apply to law schools, and that would have been a, put me on a whole different life path. And I'm very happy I stayed as a historian, because I enjoy it so much. Ted. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, you've been talking a lot about um, how people are remembered slightly differently after they die and bias and a lot of stuff like that. I was wondering if, in your opinion, are any major historical figures misrepresented or better represented or worse represented than maybe they were in life? That's a good question. Well, they're all, we're all misrepresented. Uh, there's no way you can <laughs> sum up somebody's life in, even if it's a thousand pages. It's impossible, there's so much human nuance. I mean, the whole point of Finnegan's Wake of James Joyce, or, I mean, you can, or Proust, or you cover a day in somebody's life and it's not even full, our minds works in such dramatic ways. So I don't know if you could ever capture the essence of a living spirit person um, by doing writing in the end. Um, but I hear the word bias a lot and uh, it's a comp, I just think we all have a, we're being raised here to know right from wrong. It, you know, the, whether you're, I'm Catholic, so you know, I have a, had a Catholic background and I kind of know when I'm doing something right or wrong and, uh, and just try to live your life with a, a, a degree of honesty and decency. And I think the key thing is try to make everybody's day a little better. Um, try to, if I talk to you guys after this, try to talk to you in a positive way. And even when you go to a store, gas station, be a little more upbeat. And, uh, and I think it, good things happen when you spread that kind of um, positivism. So I'm very big on, on yes and uh, positivism, not, not no and, and fear. Um, and that might come from my you know, Catholic background. I mean, when you study history, it's humbling. Every, all, look at a photo and everybody's long dead. And you know that's you soon, you know? And, and it's not, you know, we're here a very short amount of time and we all get tied up with these petty things and, uh, and little things that bother us and try to shed worry and enjoy it. And there are miracles out there. I've really kind of rediscovered the outdoors because when I hike or go out by water, I can feel, look at the miracles of a sky or a tree and have a kind of keener awareness 
instead of just constantly start my day carping and you know getting myself in a frantic mode, which I can do, but I try to well put brakes on that because it doesn't get you anywhere. And Grace. Well, moving back a little bit toward the media, um, many people in the media and uh, crazy uncles at family gatherings have been talking about the current free speech movement on college campuses and how it differs from the free speech movements that were going on in the 60s. So I just want to know, as both a professor and as a historian, um, do you think students today are contradicting the work that was done in the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, free speech is still an ongoing, it never ends what it, is, what it means in a lot of ways, but I think back to the period when really language was very, you could get in deep trouble, like the comedian Lenny Bruce would get arrested for saying something that would today would just be normal television, you know, um, babble. Um, and that was in the late 50s. I think by the 60s, things broke down with the protests, the Berkeley free speech movement and the like. Um, but there's danger with free speech. I mean, we're not allowed to safe scream fire, right? I mean, right now and, and make, you know, and do things that are, are damaging. So we just got to deal with free speech within the limits of it. But uh, I think we have to curtail hate speech because it creates hate crime. And, um, and so it's, a, it's very tricky. So all of us here say we're for freedom of speech, but we also know there have got to be some limits to it. But I'm excited anytime a young person gets engaged in the First Amendment or Fourth Amendment or whatever, you know, well, pick one, that if you're active in the 20s, it's a really good thing because it means you're engaged with American society, you want to make it better, you have beliefs, and you're getting in the game. Um, I have more problem with people that don't, I think, don't want to, um, it's about me and I don't want to engage in a civic discourse of any kind. So just be brave and, and be true to your heart and it'll all be great. But um, uh, I think the free speech movement, the First Amendment movement is, is fantastic today. You guys are doing it your way. You don't want to be emulating another decade. Well, we're right up against the end of the hour, but I, I've got one more question to give you a chance to make us all feel better today, you know, and uh, some of that positivism you were just <laughs> talking about. So last week, uh, one of our, um, I think, most respected observers of American life, David Brooks in the New York Times, he was citing slower economic growth, the, the uh, dropping out of the labor force of extraordinary numbers of people, especially men of prime working age, surge in people claiming some kind of disability, fewer Americans moving across state lines, fewer Americans job switching than before, fewer new business starts and patents and so forth. And he wrote this, this century is broken. Decel we are decelerating, detaching, losing hope, getting sadder, economic slowdown, social disaffection, and risk aversion reinforce one another. I want you to make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where your spiritual life or religion <laughs> comes in. <laughs> you know, you, as the old, I think Bob Dylan has line, either have faith or disbelief, there ain't no neutral ground. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, you, if you're, you just can't wake up every day feeling that pessimistic uh, or we would we, we, we be incapacitated, but there's a lot of truth, obviously. Yeah. To their, um, David Brooks is an incredible columnist and a friend, and I, I loved that particular column. But I try to find the good, and there are all these. If you, we we don't want to close, you know, I re read when I was young a poet, William Carlos Williams, who was a doctor in Patterson, New Jersey, and Williams would go up to the hospital roof to smoke his cigarette, and he would he used to curse about the broken glass there because people had had bought. Who broke glass on the roof? Look at this, they're trashing my hospital roof. And, and he got grumpy. And then one day the sun was shining and he saw the shards of glass with the sun shining on it, a different. Mm. And he, he realized it was his perception that it was ugly. And then he said, no, it's the beautiful sun shining on the broken shards of glass and wrote a poem about it. Um, about the, instead of letting the broken glass deter him, he turned it into a positive. And sometimes you, you have to do something like that or you would just be uh, wallowing in, in uh, self-pity and, 
and, um, and sorrow, but it, it's tough out there. I mean, the whole Buddhist philosophy of life is suffering. I mean, it's a, <laughs> that's a, a heavy trip, if that's, you know, but the Buddhists seem to be some of the happiest people I've met by, by upset, accepting that, but then finding a new forms of enlightenment. And you gotta find how you get it. I find the natural world does that to, to me. Uh, when I see a giant redwood grove in California, or go to the Rio Grande in Texas, or just hike in the backyard, or look at the miracle birds. I've, I've been, got very bleak last week, and I took my kids to an aquarium shop, because they're trying to get me to buy them a saltwater fish tank. Mm. That is a big, be careful of that operation, <laughs> you know, because they're seeing all this, but it is stunning to see the tropical fish, the different types and the colors, and you know, and suddenly I started looking at books of all these tropical fish and got very kind of happy in, in you know, so I, I do think we have to protect our planet from destruction, T technology run mad, uh, a hyper-industrialization, uh, unregulated smokestacks, dirty rivers and lakes. I mean, we've got to be stewards of the land. And Mitch did a great job on conservation when he was governor of Indiana. And uh, it's important that we have people in politics who, uh, who love their state so much that they want to be caretakers of it. Well, there's plenty for us all to worry about, but we've all, uh, everyone here has at least one thing to look forward to that'll make us all uh, much happier, and that's Douglas Brinkley's next book. So <laughs> thank you for being with us and for all thank you've done you to Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you.